I have known Irwin since the 1980s. I didn't officially meet him um, until the early 2000s. I used to attend the Vancouver Folk Festival, and as I walked in to the site of the festival, there would be a, every year a young man standing there with a little paper flyer for the end of the Volcano Festival. <laughs> and I was really struck by this. He was dedicated at that time, he was out on the street, he was getting people there to come to this festival on the North Shore. And I met Irwin uh, 20 years later here in the downtown east side where I live and work myself. And at that time, uh, my company, Vancouver Movement Theater, we began a, a community play with the Carnegie Community Center. And it was the first time that we really began to work with the community, which included, obviously, the native population of the downtown east side. And we had to get introduced to this whole notion of protocol and acknowledging territory. This was the first time that I was introduced to this whole notion of acknowledging territory, and that was 15, 16, 17 years ago. And Irwin and other people in the community were doing this. The thing that struck Irwin, that strikes me about Irwin, is that he's been at the forefront in Vancouver of acknowledging that we're on living on unceded territory and working very diligently and passionately and committed to uh, decolonization, reconciliation, changes in cultural policy. He's been there from the beginning, and it's really fantastic to see him today, 20 or 30 years later, really pushing the envelope and really forcing us as settler communities to really look very, very deeply at what it is that we're doing. And that's something that I greatly value and uh, appreciate from Erwin. I've learned so much from him um, about how to move forward in a good way with the people of this land. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Irwin, a student to the stage. Give you a big round of applause. That's very kind, nice, Terry. It's fun to have your, uh, your work reflected back. And um, I, I hope that we're going to do that today, that we're going to have our work reflected back to us. And uh, I let my colleague know when I, when, when I started to come in. And take things personally, this is about. Uh, I mean, this is a safe space. This is a place where we can actually talk honestly about the work that we do. And um, we, we've done this, this is the third year in a row that we've done this with the Heart of the City Festival. The last two years we did a Coastalish Protocol workshop we did with uh, Coastalum and Charlene Alec. We've had Gabe George. Um, we've had different Coastalish cultural leaders. And this year I suggest we do something different, but we actually just focus on settlers and migrants. And that's a new space. So we're kind of, in a way, it's, it's a problematic space, but it's also a new space. It's essentially saying, my argument is that we, as settlers, have to do this work ourselves. Uh, I'm fatigued with watching us use the labor of Coast Salish people to educate ourselves about Coast Salish protocols, about the Coast Salish genocide. Uh, we wouldn't, you know, women give men heck all the time. You know, we see all the, the Me Too stuff going on right now. Women's labor, educating men on, on patriarchy. Uh, and so, I think it's a fitting parallel. Mm -hmm. We as a settler arts community, we as a migrant arts community, are starting this work ourselves. And I'm going to raise the bar on, on, on challenging notions, and I'm going to add another one, which is that Indigenous people who are not from the Coast Salish territory are also migrants. So I use those two words, settlers and migrants. Uh, I also recognize that, you know, if you're uh, coming here as an economic migrant, that's, you're not necessarily a settler. So, Words are, are powerful, it's, it's important that we, we take this time to talk about those words, and so through this conversation today we can uh, introduce some words, explain them, and then we can, we can talk about them. I hope that we leave today having a, a, a bigger consensus and a more, um, a sense that you can go out in your community, in your arts organization, and you can have these same conversations. So in a way this is like a training of trainers. So I just want to thank um, Donna and Alex for, for staffing the door, and um, to our co-presenters, the Institute for Humanities at SFU, and uh, Angela Hall here at SFU Woodwards, uh, Brenda at BC Alliance for Arts and Culture, and also the Heart of the City Festival staff. Um, so Terry mentioned that I'm identified as a Dutch settler, so that basically means that um, 
I actually don't recognize the authority of Canada here in Vancouver. Uh, technically, we go back to 1763, the, the Royal Proclamation, when the Crown promised to protect the Indigenous of this land, and uh, that promise was broken. Uh, it's it's being argued in courts in the, in the colonial courts in Canada. I think it will still have its day in the future when when we have a serious legal discussion about the Royal Proclamation of 1763. But it is true that when the, the Canada Project was pushing across the prairies, um, that that process stopped at the Rockies, right? So the, the vast majority of British Columbia is unseated. No treaties were signed, no wars were fought. There's a few modern day treaties, uh, Nishka, Swasson. Uh, so most of BC is unseated. And so <coughs> the enactment, which I'll talk about in, in, in my keynote, the enactment of Canada, the enactment of British Columbia, the enactment of Vancouver, those are all enactments. Uh, and so this conversation is going to look deeper at how we got here. I've written a lot on this subject and, and uh, I'm just going to be pulling excerpts today. So bear with me if we, can, we, we cover uh, massive issues like genocide and um, uh, Coast Salish Protocol. We're going to kind of go through major issues in a sweeping fashion. Uh, but we do have an hour at the end to kind of break things down and have a conversation with each other. Um, so I identify as a Dutch settler. My, my mom and dad came here in, in the 50s. Um, and let's just take a minute and Paul Seelum, a uh, Squamish culture worker and educator, he, he has this lovely act, act, activity when he's talking in a group, particularly with settlers, and he asks people to put up their hands if, uh, if they were born in Vancouver. So when I ask you the questions, I just want you to keep your hands up as long as what I'm asking you stays true for you. So if you were born in Vancouver, in Coast Salish territory, if you can put your hands up. And if your parents were born in Coast Salish territory, if you can keep your hands up. If your grandparents were born in Coast Salish territory, if your great grandparents were. Okay, so we've already, three generations, we've already hit the threshold. So. If you can compare that to any other place in the world, you'll probably be getting different results. I mean, if, if we were in Amsterdam or in, or in Holland, I, you know, we could probably go 10, 20 generations back for myself uh, that we know of, uh, maybe centuries more. So, you know, that's that's something that um, I feel grief about when I when I acknowledge that, when I realize that, when I think about that. And what Ken, Kelsey Lowe told me that he was the only one in the room with his hands still up out of a big room, you know, that, that puts everything into perspective. So, typically what we also do in these events, and at your events probably, we do this liberal custom of making territorial acknowledgements. And I, and I was talking with Gabe, Gabriel George, uh, the cultural manager at Slavage, you know, he knew about this event, I said, you know, I, you're welcome to come, but, you know, really I'm going to do, the, play the trickster on this territorial acknowledgement thing, as I've, as I've done in the past. <clears throat> and um, we did uh, an event last year, uh, and that's the video on YouTube. I think uh, we've had more than a thousand views of it. It's a great educational tool. If you want to learn about making Coast Salish territorial acknowledgements matter, check that video out. Um, I argue that we shouldn't do them. And so it doesn't mean I'm post-colonial. It means um, that I think the liberal custom of making acknowledgements is actually an obfuscation tool. It's to relieve our, our typically white guilt or support our settler guilt. Um, you know, who are we thanking? And what is the basis of that appreciation? What is the relationship? What is the contract? Um, you know, are we thanking the Musqueam for not chasing us out of here? Because that's what they did to Simon Fraser when he came down the river that they were named after him. You know, they chased him back to. Uh, the, the, the canyon that would be named after him. I'm trying to not say that he named it as a canyon. And then, and then, and then he went back to, to Fort George. So, what are, who are we and what are we thanking? Uh, I've argued for some time that we shouldn't be doing these hollow gestures. I think that instead we should take 30 seconds or two minutes and have awkward silence. Or we should have an awkward conversation about the fact that our organizations don't actually have a relationship with Coast Salish people. That many of our organizations have no staff. Have no volunteers, have no uh, board members that are Coast Salish. Uh, we have no protocol agreement with Coast Salish governments or Coast Salish arts organizations. 
So I'd rather have that conversation at the beginning of our meeting. <clears throat> you're in a union hall, you're in a school room, you're in a public event. <clears throat> Talk about the absence or the, the growth of the work that you do with Coast Salish people. And so if, if you had that awkward silence, can you imagine doing that for six months in a row? You're like, oh, let's not do this. Maybe we should do something about it. So instead of, instead of tokenizing and, and placating really ourselves, our guilt, instead of slipping through into our meetings, and into our busy worlds, into our busy functions, our, our very important work, why don't we balance the territorial acknowledgement and actually make it matter? So if we actually took that time and said, you know, uh, we're in a, our church basement or our union hall, you know, we don't have anything in place. Uh, we recognize that uh, we think we're, you know, we're in North Vancouver, which is the slow dust territory, or we're over by Dunbar, you know, Musqueam, Musqueam, is over there. Musqueam Village is, is down the road here, this is all Musqueam territory. The, uh, the creatures walked around here. These are the animals, these are the, uh, the creek names, these are the place names. This is the language that was spoken. So offer that information for a minute or two. The community would learn more from that in a minute or two, and then a month later or a week later at your next event, take it to another level. If we did that for three or six months, come time for our budget planning for next year, we'd be like, you know, why don't we prioritize putting something into our budget? Maybe we can commission a, a post Salish artist. Maybe we can, you know, so what I'm saying is, Make territorial acknowledgments matter. So that was our territorial acknowledgement for today. Mm -hmm. The other thing about the labor, if, if, you know, we, uh, we ask, I, I've, I've had the privilege of working with the Slayota, and I would often get incoming emails from associates, non Indigenous associates, saying, oh, you know, how do I get a hold of so and so? How do I get a hold of so and so? Well, you can think of yourself, why, why should this post Salish person? Take time out of their family time, out of their work time, out of their community work time to go to your event. I mean, what is it that your event has to offer a this person or this slave or this Skohomish or the Muscovy? Like, what is it? I mean, if you're doing an annual festival and it's uh, <clears throat> the folk festival, we could talk about that project in, in a case study, but uh, if, if it was the folk festival, you know, you've got 25,000 people or Katsalano festival. Bizarre the name of the Festival, the whitest festival in Vancouver. Uh, almost exclusively white male bands play that festival. Um, the group and Brand Alive do that. So, Katsalano, the Squamish person comes in early in the morning when no one's there, does, a, does an acknowledgement of the territory welcoming, and then the crowds come. Right? So, who's that for? Kalsila suggests that we should barter power, we should consider these issues of power, we should think about why is this important to the slope? why is it important to the Muslim? Is it because there's 20,000 people here? That's important for the indigenous people from the land here to have that presence and have that access to those that community. That's an important opportunity for that coastal community or that government or that arts group. But if you're a small theater company in East Van and you've got 70 people in the audience, well, what do you, why do you need to take time from that, from that person? So that's just inventory I think we should, we should consider. So Donna suggested I, I should explain what redress means, because I've identified as redress activists for a long time. Um, I appreciate Terry's story because it kind of uh, uh, reminded me, um, I remember when the, uh, the Alliance for Arts and Culture would have a, a printed directory of members. I'm dating myself now. So we'd have this printed membership guide of the, the Alliance, and it'd be all the addresses. And I wrote, this is 1993 or 1994, I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to all the artistic and executive directors of all the Alliance members <coughs> in Metro Vancouver. I, I can't remember, <coughs> Brenda, how many, maybe 100. 125 members back then? Probably around that time, yeah. So I wrote them all saying, we as arts organizations in Vancouver, we should be doing something with the Coast Salish people. We should be doing projects, we should be doing, you know, please consider this. Anyway, one, one group got back to me out of the, out of the 125. But, um, but uh, I recognize that 
these terms are familiar to me, and I, and I want them to be familiar to you, and I, and I um, think it's especially critical in the context of the walk of reconciliation and the, the, uh, the gestures that were offered by the city of Vancouver or by the, the Crown. The gestures towards reconciliation, that we need to reframe those and we need to talk about redress. And I'll talk about that later, but I just want you to make sure that this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about a conversation, we're not talking about a dialogue, we're not talking about opening space. We're talking about land. We're talking about repairing damages. We're talking about changing the conversation to one of substance, which, which has consequences. Um, you know, when the murder and missing Indigenous Women's Inquiry does not in implicate the RCMP, immediately the families were saying, you know, that this is ridiculous. Why can we not implicate the RCMP when we're talking about structural violence against Indigenous women? Uh, when the Harper government and the uh, AFN, the Assembly of First Nations, built this whole TRC process, they did it with, with very uh, narrow definitions of what was on the table and what was not on the table. Right? It was structurally built to not be substantive. Yes, there's great recommendations out of the TRC report, Except, I don't see any bankrupt churches, I don't see any billions of dollars of expenditures remedying problems. If the churches became wealthy, they were built on the theft of land and the exploitation of, of subjects, why would there not be major consequences? So, redress points us in that direction. Another important word, uh, and I think, and, and, and Part of the theoretical underpinning of my work is around communications, communications theory, and, and particularly in Canada, Canada's uh, communications theory in Canada, and I'll talk a little bit about how Canada's built this fortress, this French-English fortress, and why that was. The consequence is that when you think about Pierre Trudeau and Justin Trudeau, the consequence of multiculturalism is that we, er we erase the individuality, we erase the uniqueness of each nation. We're just going to lump all the indigenous as, as together, as if they're like Greek Canadians, there's the indigenous Canadians, there's the uh, Dutch Canadians, there's the Brazilian Canadians. All right, that's a falsehood. In particular, when we're dealing with unceded lands here in Vancouver. So it's important that we avoid pan nativism it's, uh, it's, 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 it's toxic to the conversation because it essentially takes us away from the important work of nation and building. The opportunity for Coast Salish people to self-determine, to, to plan their own future on their terms. As long as Justin Trudeau is saying, in a reconciliation effort, is saying, let's build a, a constituency of Indigenous Canadians, we're, we're shortchanging the prospect for, for Coast Salish nationhood. And finally, uh, Coast Salish protocol, fundamental, um, and that's just a a screenshot from our talk we did two years ago with Heart City Festival. Um, the, any, anyone want to offer their their their, term, their definition? So guidelines, rubric, process for negotiations for agreements. So when a when a Haida is on Coast Salish territory, a Haida knows proper protocols, the proper agreements, proper uh, negotiations for acknowledging and for asking for, for permission to be here. Um, it's to navigate the, the hierarchical structure, the community structure. So protocols are, are, we're surrounded by protocols. Our lives were trained in protocols. And so we have protocols in our relationships, we have protocols in our parenting, we have protocols all over the place. So, Coast Salish Protocols is about our relationship to Coast Salish peoples, to, to their land and to the waters. All right, so I'm going to um, pick it up a notch. So Coast Salish people have, unceded, have occupied their unceded lands and waters since time immemorial, yet colonial governments mark centennial and sesquicentennial dates of incorporation with elaborate hoaxes of pageantry. These events sometimes include the Coast Salish themselves, Noteworthy is the fact that such participation is almost always initiated by the colonial governments. And I suggest this is a means of normalizing crown occupation of lands and resources. 
These celebrations emphasize the modernist Canadian tradition of multiculturalism and rely on the public's collusion as participants in order to entrench our cultural entitlement. Similarly, historical apologies and Indigenous reconciliation initiatives or selective pass wrongs are also instruments to perpetuate the colonial Canadian state and advance a program of assimilation and cultural erasure. While it may not be apparent with the warm and fuzzy hangover from public celebrations for Canada's 150th birthday, I argue that these multicultural events distort history and actually perpetuate the fog of colonialism. We are settlers and migrants here, so I want to explore the specific role denial plays in the fabric of Canada and how empirical beliefs enabled settler occupation of Vancouver nearly 150 years ago. I'll try to set forth in my talk the role of pan-nativism and liberal multiculturalism in dominant settler cultural policy, both of which promote Coast Salish cultural erasure and obfuscate opportunities for moving towards redress. In direct conflict with Coast Salish nationhood ambitions, dominant settler culture positions diverse indigenous cultures as cultural tourism commodities to enact a notion that an indigenous Canada exists. There's a consequence to this bipolar relationship to Coast Salish culture, bicolonial governments, cultural funders, and mainstream cultural institutions. Coast Salish culture and artists are structurally underfunded. I'll give you some statistics on that later. Uh, Coast Salish artists and cultural institutions lack infrastructure, they lack development plans, and, and are generally ignored by colonial governments and, cult and cultural institutions until these same cultures are used to raise big budgets for marquee events and charades of inclusivity. The premise that all who live within Canada's borders can share equally in its riches is in conflict with real reconciliation and requires silent adherence to Canada's white supremacist roots. I'm happy to talk about that in, in, in the conversation about the use of that term, white supremacy. Throughout Canada in 2017, tightly scripted birthday celebrations were held to inculcate colonialism through highly choreographed displays of public unity, fueled by almost a half billion dollars for reconciliation-themed programs. The boundaries of Indigenous participants' sovereignty and their participation with the Crown is more blurred now than ever. An important note here, you know, when I talk about Coast Salish art, cultural production, uh, by no means do I have any intent to shame participants. My, my comrade artists, Coast Salish artists who are, who are um, struggling with scarcity resources, it's important that they access funding opportunities, presentation opportunities, opportunities to be on stage, to meet new audiences. So the focus today for me is on settler and migrant cultural planners. It's on myself, it's on, our, on my colleagues the policymakers, the arts workers. So let's go back before the Indian Act. And, and Lee Miracle uh, told me in the conversation really, really to frame things as much as possible in that reality. So, you know, we're talking about 13,000 years of continued Coast Salish occupation here, at least the lands since the Ice Age, the last Ice Age. She says, just focus on pre Indian Act. So a network of families, villages, and clans has existed here since that Ice Age left. The vibrant population of Coast Salish, so Kalkomenum, Skohonosh uh, and they coexisted with a rich biodiversity. We've often heard, especially the Kinder Morgan fight, when, when the tide went out, the table was set. Often spoken by Coast Salish elders. Uh, to 90% of the Coast Salish diet was seafood. Some 50 to 100,000 lived around the Strait of Georgia and up the Fraser River to the limit of Coast Salish territory. Smallpox first reached the Strait of Georgia in 1782 with devastating effects. With more smallpox epidemics by 1850, killing up to 90% of the Coast Salish. Let me say that while I've written a great deal about this issue of genocide and, and settler denial, for this conversation, we're going to try to focus on stating that the cultural amnesia of settler Vancouverites is alarming. We could just unpack that for a few hours. We'll just talk about the fact that we don't talk about genocide. I was just mentioning the other day, is that the, the Madres de los Plazas de Mayo? Is that it? So, you know, why, why don't we, why don't we all just leave right now and go aside? Why don't, why don't we? Why don't we have 
witnesses to the genocide? Why don't we, as a community, talk about the genocide? You know, why don't we go to some problematic events with, with black outfits and, and white letters or something and just acknowledge that there was a genocide here? And that, in addition to the genocide, the culture, the policies of criminalization, uh, and the BC pen, Indigenous Coast Salish culture workers were put in BC pen 75 years ago. Right, so why don't we acknowledge that? Well, partly, we just kind of answer that when, when only one person had their hand up, when, and that was, they had three, or three generations of experience here. Right, maybe that's something to do with it. But I'll also bring in some subjects around amnesia, how amnesia works and how denial works. Knowledge and memory of the legacy of Coast Salish culture was also damaged due to the distra distraction of early settlers' research, uh, kind of excite excitement of, of Northwest Coast design. Um, we, we saw that, you know, the, the village was removed from Stanley Park and, and in came some Northwest Coast totem poles. Um, so, largely abandoning Coast Salish history to small fragments of recorded memory. Ironically, Coast Salish culture would survive due to its criminalization by going underground. According to the resettlement of British Columbia, speculations proliferated, boosters and filled the air, most natives lived on reserves as wards of the state, segregated from the mainstream of white society. To all intents and purposes, they become invisible. An immigrant, racist white society was not interested in such pasts. Newly occupied suburbs of Vancouver had their forests clear cut for newly, constru newly constructed sawmills. I, 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 do a talk, a different talk, and, and I have a slide of North Vancouver in 1893. It's, it's year one of North Vancouver. It's like, look, look at the beautiful devastation. It's just like a horrible clear-cut photo. And that's that's year one of North Vancouver. I'm like, that's what we celebrate when we're celebrating North Vancouver's 100 and, what was it, 130 years now? So what are we, what do we memorialize when we look back at our arrival here? Uh, even North Vancouver, near Wayawich and Kate's Park, where the end of the Volcano Festival took place, uh, 1949, signs saying you had to have $2,000 non Asian, that's who was allowed to buy the properties. Mm. You know, so, was that 65 years ago? So, I'm not embellishing when I talk about white supremacy in the roots of Vancouver. Um, middle class, you had an excellent amount of money, and you had to be white. By the 1970s, these growing municipalities consolidated their taxation powers by eliminating the last of the 3,000 shoreline squatters that line the waterways and inlets, requiring all residents to be signed up for municipal water, sanitation, and schools. Okay, that's less than 50 years ago that all those squatter shacks were finally removed. Right? All over Bard Inlet, Indian Arm, Kitsilano, uh, Falls Creek, uh, you go to the Finn Slough, I guess that's the last. While the world saw post-war national liberation struggles against empire and former colonies, such was not the outcome for the unceded lands of British Columbia. Following on the groundbreaking work of the Native Brotherhood, which advanced Fisher, rights, and other interests, the anti-colonial struggle was active locally. The Native Alliance for Red Power in Vancouver was connected to an internationalist, revolutionary global movement. Joan Phillips, uh, last week, uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillips' wife, talked about her, lead, her leading a delegation to China in 1975 with 18 indigenous activists from, from Vancouver. So Coast Salish peoples were in the midst of surviving and resisting genocidal colonial laws, residential schools, and the forced removal of indigenous children to be adopted by white middle class families. Deplorably, the 60s scoop shares alarmingly similar levels for indigenous child removals with today's rates. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but the rates and the 60 scoop are, as are consistent with the rates today, except now you have indigenous organizations doing that work. The aptly titled White Paper was prepared by Jean Chrétien in 1969 for then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, outlining how to complete the assimilation process. Almost a half century later, the legacy of criminalizing indigenous land defenders continues an active and passive surveillance of their lives as our government's response to demands for reparations for land theft and structural oppression by the settler society. Canada has been brought before the United Nations, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and the Canadian Human Rights Commission for its structural neglect of Indigenous children, lack of clean water and housing, 
murders of indigenous women and children, and more. CSIS and the RCP openly named indigenous land defenders as one of the greatest threats to what is referred to ironically as public safety and order in Canada. With the power of a compliant corporate media and long-standing chronic underfunding strategies, colonial governments at all levels find more effective ways to distract and neutralize to mask their true intention of subjugation, all the while appearing liberal and inclusive. For Coast Salish people to merge with both distinct societies and some form of nation-state governance, either as a Coast Salish nation or the, what we see now with the band councils, the infrastructure of culture and communications must be at the center of their communities. The integrity of the community attacked by the colonial state, cultural practices and language criminalized and punished, Coast Salish people were forced to practice their winter ceremonies in secret and sought opportunities to communicate traditional oral histories. Once the potlatch ban was lifted and public gatherings would re-emerge, the challenge remained regarding reflecting back and mirroring the culture through the emerging and colonial communication and media systems. Noted communication theorist Graham Spry stated, life is information. When defining communi communities existing intact only as far as transmissions could reach them. While he was a booster for a bilingual federalist Canadian culture and identity, emerging in opposition to U.S. dominance from the South, Spry's theories, theories also hold sway for the colonized Coast Salish in that social disintegration and isolation results if communication infrastructure is not present. Notably for Spry, the terms culture, community, and society could be used interchangeably. Spry defines society as a people in communication. A society, a community, a nation, like any organism, is a function of a network. Society is organized, integrated, and made responsive by information. For Spry and many other noted European Canadian intellectuals of the 20th century, linguistic and cultural autonomy for Indigenous nations was secondary to maintaining the borders of colonial Canada intact against the U.S. cultural and political hege hegemony. A political nation, Spry explained, is a moral and political being wherein different races are embraced with a single state. He saw the colonial, colonial Canada project as two languages and cultures peaceably, peacefully mastering, without bloodshed or hatred, a territory as great as the whole of Europe. Federal and provincial governments saw distinct indigenous languages as relics of pre-contact, and the city of Vancouver, too, would ignore the languages of the Coast Salish, which for millennia were embedded in daily rituals of living on the very land of this new city. Cantonese and Toisan, uh, spoken by the Chinese settlers, would also be structurally marginalized by the settler ruling class. English would be the dominant language, in spite of the existen existence of the hybrid Chinook jargon, Chinook Wawa, the trading language which emerged throughout the Coast Salish region, um, spoken a lot in, in the Oregon area, but also uh, 100,000 people spoke Chinook. Wawa in 1875. And it was used widely in court testimonies and in newspapers. 1875, so 100,000 people spoke Chinook. The city of Vancouver and its suburbs would dominate space through place naming, using the British, British Crown's rituals of recognizing upper class military and men of commerce. Most of these names still adorn the streets, neighborhoods, and public parks of the region, as if the land was terra nullis. If you remember that whole baggage we are carrying? Um, empty land waiting to be used. Despite all the talk of reconciliation, names such as Dunsmere, people know Dunsmere's troubled past. They want to offer it. Mining, mining baron who uh, killed workers and brutal man. So, just one of the <laughs> obvious targets for renaming. Uh, Stanley Park, um, what was it just? Five years ago, uh, Stockwell Day said, no way, no way. It's too precious, too precious. These names are deemed too central to the history of this place to be reverted to original place names. This reluctance is telling of the denial and the entitlement of the white supremacist culture still reflected in Vancouver's roots. With youthful Vancouver, it is more often than not that residents comply by identifying with a purported common history that is only mere decades old. Individual settlers who have lived here for longer than a few years or decades are a small minority, as we just witnessed. Denying, race, denying racism is, is an intrinsic flavor of multiculturalism, and with British Columbia politeness and Canadian niceness. There is no end to the charade of Canadians simply getting along. 
Cohen describes how self-identified liberals in the, up and the urban middle class turn inwards and disavow the political. They experience a cognitive retreat to avoid being upset by exposure to disturbing news. While they purportedly subscribe to universal liberal values, they're also reluctant to get involved or be unspoken. If perpetuated, this can create a pathological alienation from the self and from society, or reaction formation in the form of exaggerated defensiveness or simulated blindness to what is happening. Former Czech President Václav Havel, the poet, positions an individual's evasive thinking as an outcome of living among state cultural denial. In Vancouver, colonial branding foists an imaginative collective past onto a promise of tomorrow through public and state incentives, uh, initiatives including Greenest City, Aboriginal Cultural Tourism de Destination of 2017, World Expo 86, 2010 Olympics, Paralympics, and Canada 150 plus. These serve to repress possibilities for dissenting narratives with a kind of occult power to transform one reality into another, into another uh, to quote Havel. Whiteness is in a continual state of being dressed and undressed, of marking and cloaking. Dr. Israel Charney, a psychologist and a genocide scholar, has laid out a list of state-organized denial templates for the negation of a known genocide. These include distancing the event in time. It all happened so long ago. There's a new generation of the perpetrator people today why not let the wounds heal? Charney also suggests moving from the facts of the genocide to some kind of relativist comparison that mitigates the horrors of these events. In this way, the residential school system and its superficial TRC become the sites of discussion, and the entire apartheid-style reservation system and genocidal policies are bypassed. Our leaders routinely, routinely declare, Canada has no history of colonialism. The Governor General just did that... Uh, just four months ago. Uh, Stephen Harper stated it in 2009 while speaking to G20 in Toronto, and Justin Trudeau in New York a year and a half ago. He was talking about Canada's participation in the international arena. Quote, without some of the baggage that so many other Western countries have, either colonial pasts or perceptions of American imperialism. To quote Justin Trudeau. Back to Václav Havel. Because the regime is captive to its own lies, it must falsify everything. It pretends to pretend nothing. Individuals need not believe all these mystifications, but they must behave as though they did. For this reason, however, they must live within a lie. They need not accept the lie. It is enough for them to have accepted their life with it and in it. Claire Moon writes that post-atrocity memorialization can invoke a range of familiar cliches, coming to terms with, closing the door on the past, turning the page, closing a chapter of history, all familiar refrains used by the dominant parties urging an expedient and narrow process for Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission work. I produce a radio show Tuesdays at Tuesday afternoons, 5 p.m., uh, called Democracy North End. I interviewed Pam Palmiter, and this is just a, a bit of uh, my conversation with Pam, uh, one of the people I, I really look up to for leadership on this. Um, reconciliation is fluff. It is also becoming an industry. I've noticed that businesses are now including reconciliation as if it's a five-star gold rating. There's a lot of people out there peddling themselves as reconciliation consultants, and I find that incredibly disturbing because real reconciliation is about the return of land and recognition of jurisdiction and our access to the resources and fundamentally changing all the wrongs that have happened. Aboriginal treaty rights or land rights is not even on the table for the Trudeau government. All we are now, right now, is fluffy advertising for reconciliation. Many Canadians are going to be duped and we haven't even started the reconciliation process. Reclamation, redress, something more than merely apologies and meetings. So even with the refreshing increased profile of Indigenous issues in dominant culture, largely results of the I Don't Know More movement, decades of hard-fought efforts by Indigenous peoples, this only represents a minor thawing in the deep freeze of denial that bypasses the primary issue, that which is colonialism and the roots of Canada. Liberal and humanist reconciliation efforts divorced from indigenous nation and movements degrade the conditions for genuine reconciliation and redress. That's the, that's the alarm here. While there were many heartwarming stories this year, including ones that we saw last week about Gordon Downey, the tragic hip, there were other stories 
some saw as indications that this country has a long wait before reconciliation truly becomes a reality. In a drama straight out of The Wizard of Oz, remember the scene with Toto and the curtain? It's behind the curtain. Uh, mainstream reconciliation efforts and celebration of colonial birthdays play the role of the curtain pulled away by Dorothy's dog Toto, a four-legged creature with only minimal intellect for political discussions. Don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. So I'm going to replace Toto with Taiki Alfred, indigenous scholar. He's, he's going to intervene in the public policy performance of reconciliation that distracts from the real corrections needed to Canada's foundation and existence. He'll say, let them cry and complain. It's just therapy and worth the expense. It's better than giving the land back. <laughs> the government of Canada has strategically confounded the opportunity for real change by shifting its discourse in order to achieve the same old goals. Indigenous people's calls for treaty rights become little more than a chance for Canada to learn how to refine its tools of dispossession. Political scientist Christopher Alcantara refers to this as instrumental learning, since Canada has learned solely to advance its own interests, but I think a more appropriate term would be manipulative learning. Canada continues to develop ever more deceptive ways to deny the rights of Indigenous nations while presenting these changes to Canadians as if they were progressive reforms. And again, the, the, I'm writing a paper now looking at the history of, of communications and the use of uh, the early colonial exhibitions and those early colonial exhibitions that were in Canada at the turn of, this, turn of the last century in the comparisons to things like Expo 67 and the multiculturalism that Trudeau Sr. espoused, while at the same time promoting extinguishment of indigenous people's rights. Comparing that Trudeau Sr. work to Trudeau Jr. work, reconciliation stands in for multiculturalism, but we still have the extinguishment, right? the extinguishment program. So, um, <coughs> I think that's something that we have to explore now is the, 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 the thread that goes through these different gestures that evoke warm, friendly sentiment and feelings about our society and, and how inclusive we are, but in fact have a darker edge, which always brings us towards extinguishment of rights. So we have your stuff and then we're going to look at cultural policy. So colonial festivals and anniversaries serve the role of reformatting the collective hard drive Cohen would describe this as cultural repression becoming part of consensual reality. Blind spots, shared illusions, and zones of tacitly denied information. Collective memory is pressed into shape by being repressed. Conducting the action of celebrating a system designed to anni annihilate indigenous culture, languages, and economies requires tightly crafted messaging and unpacking. Over the bombastic noise of anniversary fireworks and self-congratulatory speeches by politicians, the language of denial seeps into all of the forcibly vacated spaces, and the growing population of settler immigrants are assured that the business of occupation is settled, and a unified, inclusive plan has been set to be followed. Celebrations direct the public's gaze to pomp and circumstance. We saw half a billion dollars worth of that this year. Instilled with liberal good intentions of Justin Trudeau with his hand over the heart theatrics, if the celebration was one of exposing the raw ugliness of domination, then the public would become alienated from the charade. Instead, it is made beautiful, and the indigenous people themselves are invited to perform as fellow Canadians. Many of the 20 million passengers at the Vancouver International Airport are treated to a massive exhibition of Vancouver Aquarium sea creatures in their rival bays and West Coast indigenous artworks. Riffing off of symbols of Vancouver culture and popular myths of an inclusive, just society, tourists are sold the cultural notion of an integrated society at peace with itself. In turn, displays at the Vancouver airport are a sense of pride for British Columbia residents who feel connected to a larger force of equality for all, the Canadian narrative of universal Medicare, and a country free of a soiled past, past or social ills of injustice. Living on marginalized reservations, Coast Salish were blocked from their economic resources, with which they could broach the communication and information divide. And so therefore were silenced by non-participation in Canadian society, if you look back the last century. <coughs> Under the direction of the CRTC, a federalist multiculturalism would emerge using national and regional public and private broadcasters to promote assimilation and cultural erasure. Federal policies were advanced by early Canadian communication scholars who feared the threat of US cultural hegemony. And until decades later, with the establishment of indigenous media options, be a community access cable, community radio, or eventually the APTN, 
Coast Salish had no option to have their culture reflected back to them. Still today, confronted by hurdles of accessing media production resources and without economies of scale, Coast Salish continue to be more likely to access Cree or Anishinaabe or Dene or Métis cultural content over their own Coast Salish realities. Just know they knew a new radio station, a new indigenous station, opening up shop in Vancouver is Nishka. <coughs> broadcasting next year will be the first indigenous broadcaster in Vancouver. Huge Nishka population in Vancouver, but again, they won't be Coast Salish. Hollywood and mainstream Canadian culture was pushed through the radio and TV systems into the indigenous homes on and off reserves. Ironically, the biggest Hollywood native star being from here, Chief Dan George of the Slow Tooth. So when Coast Salish truism is not reflected back to its people, then erasure is fast-tracked. Media, arts, and culture are, of course, critical areas of developing and supporting delivery of distinct culture. However, language is the other key element of indigenous people's culture and which was systematically attacked through the assimilative infrastructure of Canada. While a separatist Quebec was seduced to federalism through language and culture investments, indigenous languages were criminalized for decades. Federal and provincial territorial cooperation has yielded many benefits for the past 35 years and has resulted in official French language investments of about $5 billion over that period. The Indigenous languages being a tiny, tiny fraction of that investment. Just imagine if we'd done that differently. And, and as a footnote, I mean, I, I uh, on a very personal level, I've been doing, I've, I've had passion for this work around Regis for about 25 or 30 years, and, and I do now looking back at my own practice, thinking, you know, why didn't I learn Hulkamilam or Hulkamilam? And why wasn't that a part of the work that we did as, as activists and culture workers. It just, it just dawned on me like this a year or two ago. So that, that could have been something that we could have done. We could have identified that as a, as a, a way to practice redress. In travel, transition, and translation, a discussion paper that considers issues related to cultural environments and post-creation support for Aboriginal artists, C.C. Wary writes, if a community's cultural vision is clearly defined, authenticity, protocols, and artistic excellence will be protected. In turn, these foundational values will inform planning and provide balance for potentially conflicting prior priorities such as cultural tourism or business strategies that focus only on economics and structural forms. More often than not, Coast Salish culture is seen only briefly through tokenized Coast Salish protocol work which disproportionately benefits the settler cultural institution instead of the Coast Salish artists. Sharing moments of Coast Salish protocol prior to Vancouver area events is a notion of cross-cultural inclusion now normalized. What is required for the status quo to change is to halt with token gestures, which merely maintain the glass ceiling and structural marginalization, and to support and place Coast culture at the center and main stage of settler cultural institutions and festivals. So rather than the 4 p.m. slot or the 10 a.m. slot, be the primetime slots. Supporting the development and sustenance of Coast culture and language can be done by these same settler cultural institutions through prioritizing the advancement of Coast Salish culture through commissioning works and inclusive, process, inclusive policies in their own organizations. In the past 15 years, Coast Salish culture and band councils have often been called upon by the three levels of, of government to advance neoliberal and gentrifying impacts on the land, the steady growth of the city. Vancouver's restructuring as a city for elites, uh, as being Tom talked about the vertical gated communities and the restructuring work of Vancouver. Um, it's being marketed to the world as an inclusive society, and it's often done with Coast Salish iconography and symbolism. In the decades after their cultures were no longer illegal, but still facing extreme intergenerational trauma and the effects of colonialism, Coast Salish culture has persevered and is in a state of resurgence. This has been done through grounding culture to ancient spiritual tradition, traditions, as well as a result of strategic investments by settler governments, Recognizing shrewdly that Coast Salish government's cooperation on regional economic megaprojects was necessary in order to avoid lengthy legal battles and title fights. The most prominent project on this front was the Foremost First Nations Secretary that we saw for the 2010 Olympics and Paralympic Games. That was, a, that was an, uh, an instrument to deliver the endorsement of those nations. The Canadian State and Olympics corporate partners received a concrete benefit by not having the Games bid boycotted prior to the Games. 
and subsequently not awarded to Canada. The participating First Nations governments were Squamish and Lilloat, and later were joined by Slotov and Musqueam. The uh, foremost of the First Nations Secretariat calculated and bartered the value of their Olympics endorsement in exchange for money and participation. At the time, these governments calculated the investments as beneficial and likely un and unlikely to be secured outside of protracted tre treaty negotiations or legal title fights. So the 2010 Olympics delivered procurement opportunities, the building of cultural centers for some of these nations, and return of 50 acres of land to the communities just in order to secure that bid. The question of unceded land title was never on the table, and unfettered rights was equally kept away from the settler population. In telling the story of revising historical truths, as CEO of the first foremost First Nations, Tawani Joseph describes uh, to a TEDx audience how he, quote, spearheaded the largest rebrand of Aboriginal people in Canadian history. In Joseph's eyes, the 2010 project brought substantial financial and cultural benefits to First Nations across Canada and advanced their place in Canadian society. So if we fast forward from the Olympic bid of 2002 to 2004, with Anne Jo Hall here, who's host, one of the hosts tonight, uh, today. Uh, Anne and I both sat on the uh, Inner City Olympics Committee uh, that was identifying processes where the inner city would receive some benefits and mitigate impacts. Um, and I just ran into the uh, communications engagement expert for Kinder Morgan, and she was the person for the bid on the other side of the table, um, managing for the, the, um, the inner city impacts agreement. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so if we go from 20, 2002 to 2004 period, if we go now to talk about 2017 Canada 150 birthday party planning, the city of Vancouver chose to create another marquee event referred to as Canada 150 plus. The three-pronged celebration would include a celebration of West Coast Canoe Culture, a 10-day cultural tourism festival at the FIFA Women's World Cup live site, and a redux of the 2012 Walker Reconciliation. Their first Indigenous contractor was Tony Joseph, who uh, was contracted to direct, direct them with protocol and planning, so inheriting that legacy from the Olympics. With just months to go, the three local First Nation councils each selected a liaison to the Canada 150 planning exercise, and he was just weeks for, for two of them. The vast majority of contract and participating curators and arts organizations for Canada 150 have no Coast Salish cultural policies, and almost none have any Coast Salish staff or boards of directors from the, the participating curators and the arts organizations. The minimal amount of Coast Salish cultural participation, direction, and ownership is revealing. The vast majority of the paid labor producing the Indigenous-themed festival was from non-Coast Salish planners, curators, and consultants. The initiative had a $2.3 million grant from the federal government with another $2.4 million from the City of Vancouver and was operated out of the City Manager's Office, the same city department which led the 2010 Olympic bid project. Rather than be managed through a transparent cultural services cultural funding system with peer assessment or push a call for Coast artists, the City Manager's Office seconded senior cultural services staff and contractor production to Brand Live, a high-profile corporate events company which had Squamish Music Festival in Cozzolano, and now just announced a new one, post-colonial festival at Stanley Park. Again, I'm not sh shaming Indigenous artists for participating in this work. I'm arguing that cultural planners must start investing in development and legacy and no more. Um, on an individual level, I, I was uh, appreciative of the fact that city staff identified my own labor as possibly some uh, someone that could contribute to this work. Uh, I, I spent some time meeting with, with uh, the relevant parties and, and talked to them about the need to have development and legacy be the key pieces of this four point something million dollar investment. Um, needless to say, I, I didn't end up participating. And it makes me sad that we, from a policy perspective, I don't see any level of government spending $4 million. Let's say we want to have Vancouver be the international dance tourism capital. Without a cultural plan for the dance community, 
I do not see cultural planners spending $4 million on making Vancouver the dance capital of Canada. I don't see us being a theater capital of Canada without the theater community having a cultural plan for how a massive marquee festival budget can advance the sector. So I think there's a profound disconnect in practice, and we can unpack that uh, in a few minutes. Also, let's look at the political economy, so if people aren't familiar with it. Let's look at the money and the power relationships. Uh, Buffy Samuel was a brilliant concert, it was super popular, it was just a lovely summer night, lots of people had such a lovely time. Um, let's look at the other one, the, the Indigenous Fashion Show. Super popular event, sold out, that was so popular. If you look at the political economy, of the volunteer labor put into the fashion show, which is almost exclusively indigenous East Banners volunteer labor that produced that. And you look at the white men being paid full scale to produce the marquee stuff. You know, that's what I'm talking about political economy. That's what that's what we have to be changing. And I appreciate that I, I argued for um, hiring. I argue that we should hire eight or ten Coast Salish young people to, to be trained through this process. I recognize that one or two Coast Salish youth were hired. Um, but there would have been many other opportunities if we just focused on using that festival as an opportunity to do development and legacy. And I think over, um, I, I, I appreciate that Margaret Specht, who, who helped spearhead that work, and there's a lot of beautiful work in that project. Um, she's offered to share with me data so I can do some more analysis around that and, and share that back to the city staff and say, you know, this is a different way of interpreting that data in terms of the political economy in particular. So the dilemma for the Canada 150 Festival is putting what I would say is putting icing on a cake that has yet to be baked. Quantitative data analysis of the state of Coast Salish culture and representation as well as Canada Council funding levels reveals a cultural sector in crisis when compared to non Coast Salish and settler culture operating in the region. So, help me out here. What do you, what do you think? So, this is Indigenous, right? We're not talking about general arts funding. We're talking about Canada Council funding to Indigenous artists here. It's 3%. So, that's the Cree, that's Anishinaabe, all the migrant indigenous, indigenous artists who are forced to colonialism, uh, urbanization, displacement, uh, genocide, trauma, moving from their communities, coming to the cities, coming to Vancouver. Those artists are accessing funds, and there's something wrong with that. But it's shocking that in 2017, the Canada Council and other funding bodies haven't figured out the protocol work and the place-based place -based strategy to change this domination of local culture. So let's look at it even deeper. How much of Canada Council funding goes to all artists, all cultural groups in Vancouver, in Metro Vancouver? How, many, how much of that funding is going to Coast Salish? I think you know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> 99.98%. So just tell me how one can do place based cultural development with those odds stacked up against us. And what makes me so sad, which is why I gave you that long preamble about how we got here, that's why we got here. Because there's competing interests multiculturalism. Federalism versus Coast Salish nationhood, Coast Salish cultural production. And how and when those are used. So I'll give you these examples, these extraordinary examples. And Duncan Lowe, I want to thank Duncan Lowe for, for this data. Um, great cultural funding researcher. So I've taken Duncan's data and applied an indigenous lens to it. So instead of prioritizing Coast Salish culture's growth and survival, the city of Vancouver participates in an exploitive 
and colonial exercise, wittingly or unwittingly. The city and Canada benefit from the absence of cultural objectives and work plans, which could be set out by the Coast Salish cultural sector. Governments reinforce tokenistic relationships instead of investing wisely and sharing useful cultural planning strategies so that investments can emphasize development and legacy for each participating First Nations partner. By using the absence of cultural infrastructure by the First Nations, the city reinforces a paternalistic and infantilized relationship which is led by brokers and gatekeepers. Many well-intentioned, but nonetheless with an almost complete absence of Coast Salish leadership and accountability. Instead of what should be done is we should be investing in multi-year redress cultural funding to address the massive gaps in Coast Salish participation in the regional cultural sector. The city instead chose the root of a melting pot of multiculturalism and pan-native identity politics in direct competition with the nascent Coast Salish nationhood movement. Confronting pan-native arts definitions Charlotte Townsend Gold observes, what is the point of perpetuating a category called native art? When the work is irreconcilably diverse, the category is restrictive or discriminatory. It is not an art category at all, but the outcome of a socio-political situation constituted by devastating history by the shifting demographics of the non-native population in a pluralistic society. And what about the major cultural institutions? Less than 0.01% of the artists exhibited in the Coast Salish region's premier public art institution, the Vancouver Art Gallery, have been Coast Salish. Notably, that number spiked in the last two years. With the VAG's $17 million annual operating budget and new plans for a gallery site where the 2017 Canada 150 Plus celebrations took place. One must question the ethics of such public investments to promote what will likely be an Emily Carr cultural tourism destination, which itself could do more damage than good for Coast Salish cultural research and center representation. The total amount of taxpayer dollar, dollars contributed to a new gallery would be $200 million, and that doesn't include the $35 million in the city of Vancouver donating the prime piece of real estate. $235 million for a venue that really has a horrific track record of representing Coast Salish culture in Vancouver. And the, the thing that makes me the most sad is that there isn't even tokenistic effort to say, oh, we're going to put in a permanent Coast Salish gallery on the ground floor. I mean, we're not even doing crumbs. That's what makes me more sad. I mean, the statistics are horrible enough, but the fact that the arts community isn't even evolved enough to, to be even self-conscious about these gaps. So, when it's not blended with Indigenous culture from across Canada, the Coast Salish cultural resurgence is therefore hyper-commodified. It's fetishized and packaged for the notion of Aboriginal cultural tourism. This takes place, at, as I mentioned, at the arrival gates of the Vancouver International Airport at the 2010 Olympics. Artwork at Canada 150. Coast Salish culture receives little structural and ongoing funding, yet is being used disproportionately, as the TRC was used for, to present the notion that progress is being made. All is well, and business as usual. But there is an extreme disconnect between the health and presentation of Coast Salish culture and the number of Coast Salish artists actually employed in their craft, compared to the city as a multi-billion dollar economic zone. Just think of the wealth, and think of the possibilities. Throughout the branding for the 150th birthday, Coast Salish and migrant indigenous peoples are marketed as a reconciliation device consistent with recent city efforts to promote good relations with the three local First Nation governments. We often hear the modern city of Vancouver was founded on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slota First Nations, and these territories were never ceded through treaty, war, or surrender. That is a proclamation of the city of Vancouver. While a city recognition of indigenous rights has no legal or jurisdictional basis, it does promote the liberal insinuation of a shared partnership with other governments, although the true reality of the relationship is one of, it, of being in its infancy and marred with complex and competing interests. I think we just have to look at the recent development projects by MST of the Muslim Squamish Slotov Land Corporation 
uh, and its negotiations with the city, and the city pushing it over to Metro Vancouver, and Metro Vancouver pushing it over to the city, and so even when we have coalcio led reconciliation land developments, it's not necessarily a clear path. So while marquee events such as Olympics can deliver the legacy of cultural facilities and investments, it is unclear if the greater net benefit is accrued by the settler of colonial governments and the greater Canadian society as a whole. How then can a structurally disadvantaged community actually influence mass society? The motivation to the settler state of Canada to spend on First Nations governments complicity in marquee events is challenged by Glenn Coulthard. What is treated in the Canadian discourse of reconciliation as an unhealthy and debilitating incapacity to forgive and move on is actually a sign of critical consciousness, of our sense of injustice, and of our awareness and, of, and unwillingness to reconcile, states Coulthard. At its own peril, the colonial state avoids surrendering crown lands, and so coerces under-resourced indigenous communities to accept monies to participate in these elaborate performances of masking and postponing redress. Is there an ability, is there an ability for Coast Salish culture to retain an element of counter-public sphere with a colonial public sphere to coexist by revising the colonial sphere with the goal of delegitimizing or strengthening Coast Salish Protection's governments? The situation reflects what Glenn Coulthard described as indigenous self-government defined by the Canadian government. While appearing to promote indigenous cultural resurgence, settler cultural practices instead cherry-pick when and how they use Coast Salish culture to adorn its festivals and events. If Canadian cultural institutions and governments were to invest in Coast Salish culture and language, as is done in Quebec, the assimilation agenda of the federal governments would be less advanced, but the quality of authentic inclusion would be higher. Settlers hold complex and contradictory beliefs about the nature of their Canadian society. But regardless of intentions, denying Coast Salish culture its rightful place in occupied Coast Salish territory ensures it will continue to be eroded and erased from the landscapes, the schools, the museums, the art spaces, and places of power. Coast Salish culture instead will be used in an ador as an adornment, a relic of the pre-contact past, and a symbol of the hypocrisy of the generosity of Canadian multiculturalism. Coast Salish themselves will be used by settlers to deny the denial of accountability to a past marred by genocide. And one which is only in the recent era working through the intergenerational experience of violence, trauma, and criminalization, working through that. In conclusion, until landmarks are returned to the rightful Coast Salish place names and settler society moves beyond the liberal instrument of territorial acknowledgments, and colonial governments work for genuine reconciliation and redress, and the Coast Salish are held up by dominant culture as the legitimate cultural heroes of their unceded lands and waters. This place shall be merely the forever colonial Wild West. All right, so that wraps up my excerpting of these. Uh, one's a, a chapter in a book that we're looking at this winter, um, published through the University of Manitoba, and um, a paper that will be out at the Robarts Center in, in at York. Studies, Canadian studies. We have a microphone, and um, I think we're going to have some lights will go up a bit. And this is our chance to spend half an hour or 45 minutes just asking questions. Um, but I have a question for you also, and that is really about what we, the homework, what we can take away, and how we can integrate this within our own organizations. So what I attempted to do is uh, not overwhelm you with the sadness or pessimism, but to set a foundation to understand the gravity of the situation. And so that we can start to work as allies and as accomplices, specifically, to use Cleve and Ali's term. We can be accomplices with the Coast Salish people in that resurgence. And so it's not about doing the work for the Coast Salish people, don't get me wrong. It's about getting out of the way and bringing an, an, an equity and injustice as we get out of the way. Uh, there's, there's lessons for cultural funding policy. There's also lessons for neighborhood planning in your own neighborhoods, in your churches, in your unions, in your, in your arts organizations. So um, the, the real question I hope we can come away with is how can we bring this into our own groups, into our own lives?